Yes, I'm Valentine, Valentine Gogicashvili, and uh, I'm a long-term uh, speaker on these uh, conferences, and uh, this time I decided to uh, uh, talk about uh, more about how one can use Postgres in your development infrastructure, uh, and uh, <coughs> not exactly about how you do things in, inside Postgres directly. Um, so what is Zalando? A very short introduction because we are in the States. Um, probably not many of you know Zalando. Uh, Zalando is a very big uh, uh, retail store. Um, <clears throat> we sell shoes and uh, fashion items. Um, and um, we are growing rep quite rapidly. We have uh, many tech hubs in, uh, in the whole of Europe. Uh, and um, so when I started at Zalando five and a half years ago, the technology department was only 50 people. Now it's 1,100 people. So you can imagine that it's kind of uh, the rapid growth of the uh, <coughs> organization, of technology organization, made a lot of uh, pressure on us uh, to uh, improve our processes to make things work uh, nicely. So uh, how did we start? We started uh, actually as the good old uh, three-tire application, uh, web application, backend, and a database. Uh, it was uh, MySQL database. We used uh, PHP and Magento as our uh, kind of, uh, for, for our actually prototyping. Uh, but we were growing, uh, this five and a half years ago, we were growing with the uh, speed of more than 100% per uh, month. And uh, at, at the moment uh, when I came there to help the team with uh, Postgres, uh, <coughs> we've been the biggest Magento uh, users in the world. Uh, we were patching it like hell. It didn't work anymore, so we couldn't uh, scale it. So we decided to do the reboot project. So the reboot project was a very uh, <coughs> interesting endeavor. Uh, we rewrote everything from stretch in Java uh, using Postgres as our storage infrastructure. And we uh, went into relatively radical approach. Uh, the, our CTO back then had a, a lot of problems uh, with other pro projects uh, using Java and Hibernate. So he prohibited using Hibernate. Uh, so uh, we, we, we went, uh, and also transaction managers. And it was quite a nice pressure on uh, us as technologists. Uh, so we went uh, on Postgres using very heavily the store procedures. Uh, and uh, we did it very nicely, I think. So uh, this is the typical way how the micro microservices back then worked at Talando. Uh, <coughs> And uh, every service had its um, uh, Postgres database. Some databases were sharded. Uh, and uh, what we achieved by using the store procedures, that actually store procedures give you the possibility to uh, reduce the transactional scope. Your, uh, your uh, kind of, as a developer, you cannot simply open a transaction and then, half, uh, and then close it half an hour uh, later when you are finished sending files to the FTP server. Yeah? So you really have to think differently when you have to work with the store procedures. Uh, and uh, it also helps you to really do it very nicely. In tr so reducing transactional scope, thinking differently about your business logic, uh, that's what, what we achieved actually with this uh, approach. We also, with, uh, uh, using store procedures, led to very clean data state in, in the databases because uh, store procedures conta were containing more or less uh, data logic as I call it. So it's uh, more logic than uh, uh, it, it's more logic than business, uh, less logic than business logic of your application, but more logic that uh, just a simple uh, foreign key constraint. Yeah? So, um, and processing is very close to data. So that means you can process a lot of data being directly in the, uh, in the database. Uh, to, to support our Java developers, we also uh, implemented Sproc Wrapper that uh, uh, helped us to uh, map complex types easily. 
and that helped us um, to do sharding transparently. It also converted our Postgres databases into more or less RPC servers. So the, from the point of view of Java developer, you're talking to the database as, as if you are calling the functions uh, from, from your RCP server, or more or less from, from another interface. Um, I talked about, Post, uh, about uh, Java's Proc Wrapper uh, already in, in previous talks and many times. So if you are interested in this, just come to me after the talk because this is not the uh, main uh, topic of this uh, talk. Uh, we also introduced uh, the bdiv based uh, schema versioning. I also described it in my previous talks uh, and uh, it also improved uh, uh, the possibility for us to really move fast uh, with uh, um, our uh, kind of schema changes. Uh, for now, for example, our uh, technology team is uh, um, doing more than 100 schema changes per week in our uh, database uh, servers. And uh, it's kind of, they really don't have any issue with uh, changing schema, um, adding new columns, I don't know, um, improving on store procedures. Um, but as every fairy tale, uh, it comes to the end. Yeah? So we, we are still growing. We uh, want to, wanted to change our organization a little bit more. Uh, though we implemented everything ourselves and uh, the architecture that we built uh, works until now very efficiently, we actually have something like this. Yeah? So this architecture was forcing us into, into uh, very rigid, uh, technology stack. And um, we started losing uh, patience of our developers. They want to be cool. They want to, to use um, other um, interesting th uh, things. But um, yeah, so the, the new era came last uh, year actually to, to our organization. We call it radical agility. What radical agility is that every team uh, gets autonomy as much as they can get. They uh, get purpose from the company, and uh, <clears throat> they have to achieve mastery in what they do. Uh, and uh, this works quite um, good so far, but the problem with autonomy is that actually they can choose every technology stack they want. Uh, even our Postgres uh, uh, team is now uh, more or less fighting for uh, kind of to, to convince others that Postgres is still cool. Yeah, so, and uh, they're doing quite a good job. It's not so difficult to, co to, to show how good Postgres is. Um, but still, the persistence layer sh uh, should be ch chosen by the teams by themselves, and they can work in AWS. Before that move, we were all, uh, all concentrated in our own data centers. Uh, going to AWS in Germany was unspeakable for a big company. Um, so we are breaking taboos there as well. Uh, but uh, of course, as a public traded uh, company, we have to uh, be uh, audit compliant in, in most cases, of course, in every case. Uh, and uh, the audit compliance uh, brings us uh, to very interesting uh, things that so we had to work a lot to, to, to enable teams to, 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 to work in AWS. So uh, anarchy. Autonomy is anarchy? No, autonomy is not anarchy. Uh, in autonomy, we even have a uh, constitution for the teams where the, their rights and uh, um, uh, possibilities are de defined. Uh, but uh, uh, what we did to support them in AWS, we created Stoops infrastructure uh, that uh, enables us to um, comply uh, to the audit requirements uh, from kind of from from the PCI authorities and from uh, governmental authorities, um, the stoops is not so easy. So uh, I myself have uh, problems understanding it, and definitely stoops is not the topic of this uh, talk. I simply wanted to uh, say about this because it's kind of the uh, all the tools that we are building they are based on the infrastructure here uh, and. Uh, yeah, it makes it so quite 
So if you have questions about this, please um, um, ask uh, afterwards. Um, so uh, also one of the big decisions uh, that was made for supporting autonomous teams and uh, is uh, that we said autonomous teams will be building microservices. Uh, the microservices, uh, the, the applications running in the form of, uh, of microservices will be uh, communicating with REST APIs uh, and uh, databases are hidden behind the walls uh, of uh, AWS VPCs. Um, what we do in the database then, uh, we, we are not managing the central databases as we did before. Uh, the database team is consulting autonomous teams and uh, Spilo is our appliance that we uh, built um, that is using, using uh, Patroni as the high availability uh, system uh, can be used uh, to, uh, to support Postgres. Um, I will mention Spilo and Patroni later a little bit more. Uh, but the problem with microservices is that uh, uh, classical ETL processes are not really uh, possible. Uh, I think I'm missing, I'm missing some slides. Ah, no. So, and, and I will um, describe and try to describe why ETL processes are not so easy in the world of microservices. So if, you are, if your organization is running towards the microservices, uh, please think twice about uh, this decision. Uh, so the classical world, everybody is really very cool and uh, everything works nice. So the developers, they work with the, uh, uh, yeah, I even have the junior developers there, you see. Uh, <coughs> they, they, they write the applications, uh, they uh, come to DBAs for consultancy and the, uh, our business intelligence um, um, and scientists are kind of getting data uh, from the databases that we manage. Uh, our developers sometimes even didn't know that their data was transported to the backends of our uh, BI systems and analyzed and uh, report generated. Uh, and this is the classical way of doing the uh, data warehousing and uh, business intelligence. You have the ETL process, you extract data from the database and you do the reports. Um, with more uh, teams that we had and bigger services, so to say, we also had the classical ETL process, a huge uh, data warehouse uh, uh, database. Uh, <coughs> everything was fine. But uh, classical ETL process uh, has uh, some disadvantages, as you understand as well because uh, mostly it's a very hand-driven process. So you, you have to write your ETL process by hand, mostly. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, advantages is, of course, that uh, you can put everything that you prepared by your hands into a well-structured uh, SQL database that can be used by your analysts. Um, but the microservices. What, what, is, what are microservices? There are kind of, uh, it, it, microservices lead to fragmentation of your data, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, making even uh, smaller areas of domains that are separated into different systems. Uh, and uh, uh, everything is, there are no, there is no access to these databases directly for, uh, for the data scientists or, the, or business intelligence people. Uh, yeah, and our world is kind of going down, yeah? So, but we have the, the solution. <laughs> Postgres has the solution for that. Uh, so what, what we are working now on in the, in the prototyping stage is that we are building uh, the system that will extract uh, changes uh, for kind of flowing from the uh, teams. Um, make it available for stream processing, making it available for kind of uh, archiving in data lake, making it available and uh, materialization into some kind of automated uh, DV, DV, DVH process. Uh, so uh, one of the possibilities is that business logic itself writes data into your kind of 
collection system um, bypassing the database. But this problem has a huge, um, th th this approach has a huge problem. And this problem is not visible from the beginning if you haven't thought about it uh, um, uh, enough, so to say. So first of all, it's very error prone. If you don't automate the way how you push changes that you do to your entities in your database, uh, you will be just making a lot of mistakes. Uh, another pro big problem is uh, the problem of um, uh, double write. Yeah? To, to do double write into two systems and to, to have consistent, uh, consistent state of your data in your storage and in the bigger storage of the uh, business intelligence people on the world, uh, you have to do a two-phase commit. And doing two-phase commit is usually very inefficient. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to implement. By the end, it's very difficult to implement. Another possibility is to extract the changes directly from the database. Uh, this approach has uh, advantages. Uh, you, you cannot miss anything. You, you write to your Postgres, Postgres commits it, and then uh, generates the wall replication stream that actually contains all the changes that you need to your data. Uh, and uh, no additional work is needed on the business side. So to, on the business logic side, the, your application writes to the database as if it was the database. And uh, all the information, all the changes that are happening to your data are automatically extracted. Of course, there are some, now I'm a little bit lying about the simplicity of this approach because you still have to map your entities somehow. So the, the, this arrow there could be quite complex, but still this is one kind of central, centrally managed, not managed, but developed system where bugs can be tracked uh, and fixed in all your infrastructure and not uh, in every application and every business logic that you have to uh, look at. So uh, how to implement it? So actually, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Simon Ricks um, very much for uh, envisioning and pushing the ideas of uh, wall replication in Postgres. Uh, when, he, when I was talking to him several years ago and he was pushing this, uh, I didn't really understand the whole importance of, the, uh, of this uh, feature that, is come, that came to Postgres. And this feature is really uh, Im immense. Uh, so we have already uh, PG Logical from uh, second quadrant that uh, allows you to extract data from the um, replication stream. Uh, there is a bottled water by Confluent uh, that extracts data, uh, <coughs> converting into uh, kind of serializing in Avro uh, and pushing to Kafka. Uh, we also did some uh, work on the bottled water and we um, patched, kind of forked it uh, to extract data in JSON uh, for our purposes. And we have a Tavon uh, system that uh, we use for parallel snapshotting. So you can extract the whole existence uh, database uh, into your stream uh, and then go on uh, fetching data from the logical replication stream. Uh, how uh, does it work? So you have the uh, streaming plugin, so you can use uh, either of um, uh, two or hopefully more plugins that are coming um, in the future. Um, <coughs> you do the snapshot uh, of your data when you're starting your process uh, into the queue and then you use the uh, stream processing application to go on sending data. Uh, into the queue. This way, uh, another project of ours is, um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really scared to say this, it's kind of rebuilding the enterprise um, message bus. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a small uh, broker on top of Kafka to enable us uh, to um, kind of monitor better and uh, to um, keep track of the structures that we're pushing into the Kafka. Um, uh, but this is, also out of the context of this uh, talk, so you, you can, uh, you are uh, more than welcome to um, ask me uh, 
uh, questions about this. And I will be really very interested to discuss these uh, topics uh, for anybody, with anybody who is actually related to uh, messaging buses and um, event sourcing and all this thing and stuff. This is, these are very interesting topics and I will be really very glad to discuss these things with you uh, guys. Um, yeah, try it yourself. So, um, we worked very hard uh, uh, to uh, push the possibility of uh, uh, decoding logical replication stream, uh, uh, kind of fetching re logical replication uh, stream in uh, using uh, PsychoPG. Unfortunately, the pull request is not yet um, merged, but everything is done, so we're just waiting for the uh, committer uh, to, to push, uh, to, to merge. So you will be able uh, to uh, <coughs> experiment with uh, uh, data streams that are flowing from the uh, uh, from the your rep uh, replication uh, logical replication slots and uh, rewrite it or push it into Kafka or push it into um, or send it to the moon or whatever you would love to uh, to do with it. Um, Yes, Tavon um, initial snapshot export tool, as I already said, uh, and uh, um, yeah, the projects that we are doing are all open source. Uh, other projects that we do, um, you can have a look on, on, the, on them uh, at these tools that I mentioned on, in previous years. There are um, other tools that are available in our GitHub account. Um, yeah, I'm somehow very fast. I usually, uh, I, I trained to, 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 do, to, to do it faster, but um, yeah, it's, uh, I usually need 35 minutes to, do, to say that. Okay, may, maybe I was uh, talking too fast or there were no questions at all. Uh, yeah, so, but now you have uh, the possibility to ask questions, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, really, uh, is it like a governance, like around uh, what the protocol actually is, or what the autonomous vehicle should be using for development? Um, I didn't understand the question. So, we still know if it's a self-managed chaos. Ah, Stups, this, uh, the, the, So the question is, I think, the, this uh, Stubbs, you mean, the Stubbs infrastructure. Yeah, so what, uh, what Stubbs infrastructure is doing. Yeah, so the uh, Stubbs infrastructure actually manages, so what uh, AWS is usually is the, uh, the audit log of what you do. So from the point of view of auditors, you always need to know, so when, when something is running in your uh, AWS account, you always have to have a possibility to say that the, okay, this application is running. Uh, what is the version of your code uh, in your uh, versioning control system that is running it? And uh, who made the change that is responsible for this um, kind of, for this application? So uh, that means that there, there should be, uh, from the audit, uh, auditing perspective, at least in Europe, uh, what uh, the requirement is that you have to always have a possibility to say that uh, any uh, merger in, in the production code should be done using the uh, four eyes principle. Uh, and uh, so that somebody should be reviewing it and this should be documented who reviewed it uh, and then rolled out when you roll it out, you have to have a possibility to track uh, from, from the version of the application and runs to, to back to the commit message that was kind of leading to emergence of this application. And this is application, uh, th these are requirements when you start to think about how to implement it, it's not so easy because you have to really track all the services that you have, you have to track the versions and uh, uh, you have to um, somehow register the versions and so on. On your yeah. next slide, you add like a whole question. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so can you say uh, just how you are doing it? Because I went to uh, museums in Cloudfield or AWS and other 
Yes. Uh, so uh, actually, there are uh, the systems that uh, manage the uh, security. So you, uh, we, we have the, um, we use OAuth for uh, all the authentication uh, for all the REST services that we that we have, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, also, for example, uh, when you are uh, rolling out your application, we have the uh, special uh, sensor plugins that are using CloudFormation to roll out the changes, um, kind of. To, to, to package and uh, uh, in a, in a, we use Docker as well. So you, your application is packaged in a Docker and rolled out uh, in uh, specially prepared uh, mm, Linux version, so to say, that is rolled out on the, uh, on the EC2 instances. And this Linux version includes underneath uh, the uh, integration uh, with uh, Logging services like uh, uh, which which logging services I, I think Logly uh, and uh, it inter integrates with uh, our um, other systems that are kind of um, sending out the kind of storing the uh, audit logs more or less yeah. and the the whole system is open source you can actually replicate it uh, but. Uh, um, you will definitely need to uh, read documentation a lot to understand how this thing works. Yeah. And it, it makes sense only for big organizations. I don't think that for smaller organizations it makes sense to uh, add this additional complexity uh, for, uh, for, for you to kind of to work nicely. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, how do you handle DDL changes uh, across the logical replication? And then also, how do you handle um, folks that are not being able to read from an analytical perspective, you might need two or three more attack data points? How do you handle that cross database thing? So, uh, this is the project that uh, Saiki team is uh, doing. So, this this um, BI team that is here. So, this this team. So uh, the uh, automated entity materialization engine, uh, what, we, what we do is the, that we, um, we try to have the registry of all the entities that are flowing into, uh, into our um, uh, Kafka system. And uh, using this uh, registry of events um, or registry of types, so to say, uh, to uh, materialize them from JSON into uh, tables, kind of tables uh, in our DevH system, and then uh, uh, bring the uh, entities that are spread across different services uh, into one materialized super entity. So for example, if you have uh, uh, customer information, customer payment information, uh, customer address information, customer, uh, I don't know, um, risk scoring information. So all these uh, uh, topics could be actually merged into one super entity because we know that all these entities use the same primary key as, as customer number. So you can actually uh, merge them into one big structure uh, that will be much easier to use uh, by the analytical, uh, by the analytics uh, uh, teams than just having many different uh, entities. Yeah. So this is the, um, we're now experimenting with that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can show you some prototypes if, you, if you're interested. Yes. The, the the question is um, um, why do you want to wh why do we want to do analytics separately from uh, from the machines that uh, so why not to do analytics directly on the uh, on the databases uh, themselves? This is actually very uh, close to the uh, previous question. Uh, the uh, problem is that uh, uh, microservices keeping the databases separately. 
they don't have the full picture. So you cannot do analytics on uh, data. You, you cannot actually correlate data between different systems uh, if you don't have access to different systems. And this is uh, more or less the reason why we're trying to uh, collect uh, data from different flows and from different applications. Yeah. Yes. Yes, the question is um, that, uh, or the claim is that uh, microservices uh, usually, so people who write microservices uh, are not using uh, relational databases, yeah? So quite often. Uh, I don't know if it's a property of microservices because uh, I think it uh, just uh, happens so that uh, people who happen to write code during the era of microservices don't like Mm, relational databases. Um, so uh, what we do, we talk to people and explain to them uh, all the problems of, uh, uh, that they will see with um, non-relational databases. Uh, and we have several teams that uh, went to Cassandra and then went back because uh, the modeling is so complex and uh, it's uh, uh, actually you need Cassandra only in, if your application should scale really uh, really, really very much, and uh, that will not definitely fit into Postgres interest, uh, so world. Uh, so uh, we talk to, to people, we try to understand what their real, uh, us um, real usages are, and we uh, also train people to, uh, to understand better how Postgres works. So in, at Zalando, we have the uh, whole set of uh, trainings for our developers uh, to kind of for understanding how Postgres works, uh, what SQL is, and what are the uh, advantages of having one master uh, for now. Uh, uh, then, no. Yeah, uh, one, one master that, uh, and not kind of not, Classical non non uh, no no SQL database. Uh, yes. Uh, the question is uh, uh, how, how much uh, uh, logic is extracted away from the database to a business logic. Um, I think that uh, there, there is a tendency of um, the developers to uh, bring the logic into the zone of comfort. Uh, so uh, they tend to extract as m to put as much business logic as possible into the environment where they feel most comfortable, and these environments are usually not PLPG SQL uh, store procedures. Uh, so we have a very strange situation that it's kind of older people who know very well how. Uh, PLPG SQL works because they work with them. They, they tend to keep business logic and data logic there. And people who are uh, kind of new and uh, haven't had all this experience, they are tending to push uh, business logic into the, um, into the application. Uh, I personally think that the, there is uh, some, there should be some kind of a golden uh, yeah, golden average. And uh, I started, as I said, say, uh, talking about data logic and I asked people to put 
uh, put the logic that is related to consistency of data into the uh, store procedures or into SQL uh, and uh, yeah, do the calculations in, in, in Java. Uh, we didn't, uh, I think we didn't roll out uh, the PL V8 uh, on our um, classic, on, on our old databases. Yeah, but now I think Spilo appliance that uh, the uh, database uh, guys are um, developing uh, includes all these uh, store procedure languages and they're also experimenting to include the site SDB, for example, into the appliance. So. Yes. Um, how does your infrastructure team and security group, do you have infrastructure people on each of the teams or a centralized one? And how do they deal with things that are going to be commonly reused, like I'm going to need Redis in all these environments or things like that, and you don't get team integration? <sighs> yes, the question is how the infrastructure uh, people are distributed between the teams. So we, mm, it's a complicated question. So the, uh, the thing is that we are coming from the uh, organization where infrastructure teams were centralized. We had the platform team, so to say, where um, the database team was also part of, uh, that was doing all these infrastructure related things and um, database, if, if somebody wanted to install a new database, they were coming to database team. If somebody wanted to install a new Redis uh, system, they were coming, coming to database team. If they wanted to, I don't know, to bootstrap new, uh, Apache machines, uh, Tomcat machines, they were going to the system uh, team. Uh, now the database team and system team are more consultancy uh, teams. Yeah, so uh, we, they, they still also uh, take care of the old uh, vintage applications, but uh, the, the idea of DevOps is kind of, we, we support this idea. So we want people to learn themselves how to manage uh, their services. And AWS helps a lot because in AWS you don't need to think a lot uh, how to mm, bring um, Redis system up. Yeah, you, just, you just bring it up. Yeah, and, uh, but this is a good question. Yeah, how, how to, uh, what, what is the balance there? So, but I think that the, it's quite difficult not to have a centralized team that uh, maintains the know-how uh, and uh, we, we want to keep this uh, for these people with knowledge that, will, that are working as consultancy for other teams. Yeah. So any other questions? I'm really, I really feel Stupid that it's, uh, it was so short. I actually, actually, I have uh, another f 40 slides because uh, uh, I thought that there will be some questions that they will be uh, kind of showing and uh, going on uh, um, uh, answering, but uh, uh, the questions are going into the other direction. <laughs> yes? What's your uh, experience comparing microservices with the old fashioned procedure? Uh, uh, the, the question is um, uh, if one can uh, compare microservices and uh, the old way of doing it. Uh, I think microservices lead to, uh, for, for lead to the process of rethinking of uh, what, what is your, what are the borders of your uh, domain model and what are the borders of your application. Um, uh, I think it's, it's a good direction, but uh, one has to consider the problems that, that you, you have with it. Uh, yeah, having a monolith is not inherently bad. Uh, I have completely different ideas about the, I personally have completely different ideas about microservices. Uh, I, I, I personally think that microservices is just another step to something better uh, and lambda architectures are uh, rising and uh, 
Um, I, I think that it still, the development of the uh, architectures will go into something that is more um, kind of data anal analysis driven. So where you have the execution plan for the whole application and the, exec and the execution planner will distribute the, your code on different machines and so on. So, but, but it's my crazy ideas that <laughs> but this, this actually happens already with the Lambda architectures. If you look on the AWS Lambda and uh, all other big um, um, uh, cloud providers are working in that direction, uh, it's more or less happening already. You can write uh, your application, the, the whole application can be written in different languages uh, in the form of small Lambda uh, snippets and then they will work together. And what, what is still missing is the execution planner that will un understand and measure the flows between these uh, functions and then d make decisions where to put them, uh, how to run them. Because theoretically you can put the, yeah. But as I said, this is a more, I, I would love to discuss these things with people who are uh, interested in it, yeah. Yes. Yes, I think I, I think uh, this is a zeitgeist now uh, that that goes into that direction. Yeah, so automatic uh, scheduling, automatic understanding what you need and how to distribute the things. I think in the future, in, in relatively close future, we will have something like. Actually, now we never think about how the um, processor is distributing. Uh, processor commands between the cores. Um, it just happens without our, our knowledge. So this should happen also for the, for the bigger scale, for, for the applications. Yeah. So we have still a lot of time for uh, questions. <laughs> I hope it was not too short or too boring. Um, so.